shining from the light in my heart As I praise my Lord right from the start Tears of joy overflowing from my eyes All the pain in the past was a blessing in disguise In the middle of the night I will supplicate to you As darkness fills the room The prayers make me feel brand new Tranquility The break of dawn comes too soon Belief in your mercy makes me feel I'll never lose Ashraqat nafsi bi nurim min fuadi Hina maradatu ya rabba al-ibadi أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله نبيه الكريم الحمد لله um thank you everybody for showing up my name is Isaac Bronson or Sean Bronson however you want to say it um today we have a very very important topic today for our Wellness Wednesday and it is seasonal depression and suicide both of these topics are very pertinent. Um, and since it's not only so serious, we're going to have a lot of, I think, people watching. We're going to have a lot of people that want to say something and talk on these Zooms. Um, so I just want to start right now by thanking everyone for showing up. And, <clears throat> and um, especially, we have special guests today. We have uh, Nefertiti. How you doing, Nefertiti? Um, she's going to be talking today about her experience. Thank you so much. We got Franz in the building. What's up, Franz? And uh, um, other special guests. My sister. I can't call her my little sister. She's not the littlest one. But she's still my little sister. I love her to death. Donitha, how you doing, lady? Okay. Hello, hello. <laughs> and of course, as usual, I have my Wellness Wednesday team. Sister Yusma. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Brother Bye. Gareth. This is going to be one of those topics I think we're probably going to run over, so be prepared. Um, when I first wanted to propose this topic, it is because of some of the groups that, that we're in and some of the, and the programs that I work in that really made me believe that this thing actually exists, the seasonal depression part. I didn't think it was a real thing. We know suicide is a real thing. Um, but when I first came to the, you know, to this particular program, uh, you know, most of us know that I work in uh, Kings County Hospital, right? So when I first came to the program, I had some preconceived notions of of what, um, you know, depression was, what it can be, and what it should look like, and what it shouldn't look like where it comes from. And as I started talking to people, I started to realize that, you know what? People connect a lot with dates, you know, <clears throat> like dates and times. Alhamdulillah, and I say, you know, I thank God every day that I'm not like that because uh, I don't, I don't know, for some reason, I don't retain dates well. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that's a good thing because I took a lot of, a lot of losses in my life like some of us. I don't remember, you know, like when the closest person to me, my uncle Sean died, who I you know I spoke about, who I'm actually named after, you know, it's more like my bigger brother. Like we were only four or five years apart. We stayed in the same house most of my life. And when I lost him, you know, it, it you know, it was a big deal in my life. My whole thought process changed from the way that I was to the way that I became. But I didn't realize, you know, how it affected me until you get older. But I don't remember what day he died. I don't remember that. I don't remember, you know, I don't really celebrate too many holidays, so I'm not really attached to it. But as I started to get around some people who were, I started to see the change. Like, people who were happy-go-lucky, when holidays started to come around, it's like, yo, this is the first day without my wife. I lost my wife during COVID. This is, the, you know, the first, 
you know, winter or, or, or holiday season, you know, since my mom passed or my mom's passed two years ago on this date. And I'm like, wow. And you see the changes in the person's attitude and their mood. And it's like, you know, these are the times that we really should be, you know, checking in more on our relatives and our people. Because a lot of us put on the front. I just heard a story today and I'm, then I'm going to let somebody else talk. But I heard a story today <clears throat> about, uh, you know, a young um, a young lady, excuse me, yesterday about a young lady, how, you know, her and her brother were growing up. They were real close and they were always together. And then as they got older, the sister went to college. The brother went to the military. So as the brother came back, you know, the girl was always, you know, she was real fun loving and everything else. So she decided, OK, I'm going to get married. So as she's getting married, I think her husband was a police officer or something like this. But he was very controlling. But when she was going to get married, she wanted her father to walk her down the aisle. Now, her father had abandoned her and her brother as little kids. But that's still her father. So she went and approached him and he rejected her like, nope. You know, I, I don't you know, I don't feel any connection. Whatever the case is, he didn't walk her down the aisle. So she went to the next person, which was the uncle and got rejected. So then the brother wound up walking her down the aisle, which everything turned out OK. But then he said after a while, just her being in a controlling relationship with her husband, he started to see the sister change and she would reach out less and less. She started to isolate. But anytime he saw her, she was still the life of the party. She was still smiling. She was still, you know, herself. But as he would see her walk away, he could tell she could tell like. You know, when she was on her way home, she was a different person. Like, she didn't want to go there. You know, like, you know, they, there was an issue there, obviously. So when they started to delve into these things and ask her, she would say, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm all right, I'm all right. You know? And then the next thing you know, it was one, one of the holidays. She came over to the family. Uh, she came over to see the family. Or was supposed to come and see the family. She wound up ODing on something in the house. Where she took some pills and OD. So, of course, the family goes there. They go try to console her, everything. She, you know, in the in the bed, they were saying in the hospital bed, she was telling her everything's going to be okay. It was just a one-time thing. I feel all right. Long story short, after two or three attempts, the last time he saw her, they was at the family's house. He was the same person. You know, she came, she was laughing, joking. She was. Then she had to go home. Next thing you know, they got the call that she was gone. You know, she took her life. This time she shot herself in the heart. You know, it's sad because a lot of us see signs and don't know what to do. A lot of us um, hear people say this. I've heard people say they wanted to kill themselves before. And we chalk it up. Some of us are like, yeah, they're just looking for attention. Sometimes it's like that. It's kind of crazy, but it's like, you know, maybe this person, especially if they say it more than once or they say it twice, they say it three times after about the sixth or seventh time, you're like, ah, you know, this person just wanted attention. They ain't, they ain't serious about it. And then when it happens, we all caught off guard like, oh, man, if I had only. You know, those are the thoughts. I want to actually hear from my sister, Danitha. Um, for those who don't know, that's. I said it before, but I'm going to say it again. That's that's my little sister. My Charlotte. <laughs> So, so I just, we just want to hear from you. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear a little bit of your story. Let us know what you're doing now. And like, you know, walk us through a little bit and how you progress and then what you're doing now, what you like. Okay. I'm going to throw up a disclaimer real quick. Um, this is going to be a lot of stuff, Sibby, that you are hearing for the first time. It's all good. That's what we have. And for. I apologize that you had to find out this way. Okay. Um, I want to also disclose that I would like to use this as a testimony, as in to don't pity me. Okay, I've ha I do suffer from mental illness. Um, the list is too long to mention. Um, I also had a I've also attempted suicide three times, and apparently, God said I had a job to do. So I'm glad that I'm one inside instead of the other. Um, th there's a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of, um, 
it, it's a it's a lot like family history just of worthlessness isolation manipulation just victim of circumstances things like that and i just decided you know what at at that time when i wasn't in my right head space i just was like you know what i'm done there's no there's no way to see the bottom of that tunnel so after the third attempt and i realized i was hospitalized for a few weeks and i realized that something has to give something has to change i have something to live for at this point i had my son and and he was young and i'm like you know what if it didn't work the first three times it's probably not going to work again I need to learn this lesson. I there's things that I need to do and there's things that I need to change. And with the right medications and the right diagnosis from caring professionals that work with me, I was able to get my life back on track. And here I am now able to tell this story to where now I am a life, a certified life coach where I can help people not make the same mistakes that I did and to be more sympathetic and to guide them through the process along with just letting them know that having professional help like a therapist, a psychologist and having medication to stabilize your mood and to make sure that you're okay mentally, to make sure that it's okay. And it's not, I'm about to tear up. I'm sorry. It's about, it's not, the end is just a chapter of your life that you need to address and that you needed to close. And I had to find that out. And I'm just grateful and I'm just happy that I'm able to tell my story in the brief time that I did because I wasn't able to do that with anybody because it was always, well, you could pray it away. There's nothing wrong with you. And it was just, or I was made fun of. And I was just dismissed. Family, friends, people who I thought was my friends. Um, just the outside. I always thought I was a weird. Oh, people just thought I was a weirdo. And now I embrace my weirdness. Yes, I'm quirky. I'm all this and then some. And I know I'm weird. And 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 I and I love that part about me. And for people to say, oh. Well, if you, and I've heard the same thing over and over. Oh, it's just a cry for help. It's just a cry for help. Yeah, because when you're not in the right mind frame, you don't know what else to do. If other options is working, if you're saying I need to go to a doctor and you're being ignored, maybe, and I used to do this, like, well, maybe if I kill myself, maybe everybody will be fine. Oh, you're not going to do it. You just need an attention. You have emotional problems, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, I do, but you're not acknowledging that. So what can I do to make you listen, to make, to realize that, yeah, this is a problem. And what, and what people don't understand is when we decide that we just want to end it all, it's not a it's not a thing where we're ungrateful for life. That's not the case. We just don't like the hand that we was dealt. And we don't see a way out of it because all the resources we had were exhausted and we don't have the right support systems. We don't, we're not guided to the right facilities in that case. So it's like, look, you put me here. What are we to do? What, what am I doing here? If this is what I'm here, if this is what you put me on this earth for, then I'm out. It's a checkout. And and it may seem selfish to a person outside looking in, but it's not because it's more of a sacrifice than anything. But now that I'm in a better headspace and I've experienced this time and time again, there are resources out there. There is help and there's people who are willing to listen because I think we're now in this day and age where it's more prevalent instead of everybody shuts up and no one says anything. And then the one who did the most be at the funeral crying the loudest. And I'm glad that this is a safe space that this can be discussed openly without judgment, without persecution, and mm. to let everybody out there know that yeah, it's okay. And you're not the only one. You're not alone. You'll never be alone. Just reach out. You have people out here to help you. And I'm yeah. glad I did. No doubt. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. 
listen to me uh, very carefully. If there's no one on the planet that tells you they love you, you know I do all the time. And there's nobody... Um, I felt that. You know, when you say... Um, you know, like your resources were exhausted. I get it. The people who were supposed to be there, you know, yeah. are the ones that, um, you know, they kind of turn their back and it sucks. You know, unfortunately we have some of the same people, right? So we, we know what, <laughs> we know what that's like. Unfortunately, you know, that is the case. And it's just like when you reach out for help and I want to say this to you, you know, even though it is a little bit personal, people see you as as a pillar and strength all the time. So they don't check on the strong ones. You yeah. know, you were the one that you were the tough person out there, put you know, putting that work in, in the streets. You're not supposed to be vulnerable. And I'll tell you, you know, and it's and it's kind of crazy because, you know, we have the, you know, we share a parent, right? But we still we come from, you know, we still kind of cut from the same cloth. I've always been a weirdo my entire life. I embraced that from, from day one. You know what I mean? You know, and I was always that guy um, that didn't mind being different, didn't mind, you know, being looked at because I think because of the way I moved around. Um, the way I moved around so much and the way I didn't really have a home base. I was all over the place. Same. You know, I know. And we, you know, well, like I said, our, our lives parallel. It's weird. Like, for people that don't know us, we didn't grow up together. You know what I mean? Like, this is my sister, but we, we didn't grow up together, unfortunately, like like we should have. <clears throat> but we've gone through some of the same stuff. You know, we've experienced a lot of the same things. And it's because of generational trauma. Our parents, our parents went through so much stuff. You know, and it's not to give people a pass that should be there when they're supposed to. It's just understanding why they weren't there. It, it was just they some of some of our parents couldn't give us what they don't have. And I understand that now. But when you're going through it, I don't you don't understand it then. You know, um, and when you're well, going when through you it, see- it's like I know I can't check on that person. I know, I already know. They're not even equipped to handle it. Guess yeah, what you're gonna say? Yeah, or when you see when you see it extended to other people, yeah. but it's not extended to you and Absolutely. you feel slighted. And that just digs you further down the hole. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the weird thing about that is it's like it's easier for me, it's easier for me to deal with somebody I don't have an emotional attachment to. I could give the most, I could give the best advice to a stranger. And then when it comes to somebody I, I you know I'm supposed to love or I know I'm supposed to come through for, I can't do it. Not saying me personally, but this this is what we see. Yeah. It's just so easy for for us to take care of everyone else. I've seen that in plenty of different families before, where the the parent outside, if you ask them about their father, if you ask the people he hang out with, the other people down the hall, the other kids in the area, oh my god, he's the most fantastic person, but he's a tyrant in his own house. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's a complete moron in his own house. He don't deal with his own kids, but you know. But we'll go down that that road later. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you for your courage and your honesty. You know, and like you said, some of that stuff I never heard before. And I'm sure there's a lot more. But these are things I keep telling people like, yo, I do this as a profession. So if I could do it for strangers, I could definitely do it for my family. I'm always all ears, you know, um, you know, especially for you. You already know. I might, you know, it, it, I can't say you my favorite sister online, but you know what it is. <laughs> and you're my favorite brother. I don't yeah, have a problem Allah. saying that. Mashallah. So I would say this. So I mean, but I'll just to say and to piggyback on that, or actually to further the point, um <clears throat> it it takes a, a lot of strength for somebody to just come out right off the rip and, and state the facts like that about their life. And I want it to be, you know, serious um and to and for it to be understood what type of what type of person uh, does that? What type of person comes out and lets you know exactly what they're feeling and what they've been through and pour their heart out online? That's it's a tough thing. Knowing that people are watching, knowing that there's some somebody's going to judge something, and unfortunately, especially in our community, that's what we do. You know, first thing we do is judge them. 
we could be pouring out our heart like, yo, did you see her nails? What does that have to do with what does that have to do with the price in tea in China? It's just unfortunately that's what we do. But I wanna um bring up my sister Nefertiti. Uh, you know, I'm adopting her as my sister now. <laughs> I received but, uh, it. <laughs> okay. Papers but, are already signed. We're good. It here. is the papers are signed already. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> but just um please tell it the same thing. Tell tell us a little about your story and then what Absolutely. you're doing now and um good. Hmm. Evening. I'm Nefertiti. Blessings and greetings to all. Um, so uh I'm gonna try to do a brief summary. But um, you know, I think my depression started as a young person. Um there was issues with abandonment um from my mother, um, the matriarch of the family which I think in that time she thought she was doing the best she could, right? And I, I can't um, fault her for her decisions. Um, it it was um, damaging to me, but in that time, I don't think she, she meant it to be harmful. Um, I was left in Georgia at one point. You know, she told me, let's go visit your family. And she said, you're staying. I was 15 years old. Um, so that happened and I was there for a year. When I came back, uh, the bond was broken, right? Um, and so as be, as my mother being the, the sole parent um, and raising a female, uh, it was it was it was tough because I didn't have any guidance, right? And um, I found myself to the streets. Um, I, I found a boyfriend who I thought was going to be my partner. I got pregnant at seventeen. Mm -hmm. Um, and the story was, don't have any kids. Don't bring no kids home. You can't be here. Two women can't live in the household, that sort of, sort of thing. Um, and so at 17, at 18, I had an abortion by myself. Um, and so with that happening, um, depression really kicked in, right? Because there was a part of me where in a way I wanted something that was my own but I didn't have the the means or the resources or even the support um, to, to, to carry on. And then um, it was a regret, right? But again, we can't show that, especially coming from, um, I would say our community, uh, people of color, right? It's like, you gotta move on. You gotta stay strong. You gotta put that face on. So um, it turned into have a drink and that will cure, you know, your ailment whatever it is, forget about it. And I drank for 20 years. Um, I moved out when I was 20 and was on my own for that, this, this amount of time. Um, and um, unfortunately, alcohol was my, my way of coping for those 20 years. Um, I found myself dealing with depression throughout the time. At 18, I, I tried to kill myself. Um, I drank and I took pills and I said, you know, the same thing like Denise said, like, yeah, I'm not worth it, right? I did this to myself and now I have to pay, you know, and, and throughout my depression, throughout my drinking, I think punishment was my cure to the feeling, right? It was like, I can't feel this way, you know, even if it was depression and I knew it was depression, I just couldn't. I couldn't admit it. I couldn't deal with it. Um, and so there's, there was two other times. Um, so a total of three that I did try um, in, in desperation to, to not be here. And the third time um, was it took somebody that I had, a family member that I lost, right? She, she passed away unexpectedly. And um it was super hard because I was so proud of her. She was 24 um, and she drowned, right? She 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 had her whole life ahead of her. She was doing the, the best. She believed in her and God. She graduated school. She came, overcame a lot of hardship. Um, she was going blind, those type of things. And she, you know, supposedly the Lord took her, right? And I'm like, I'm a... <laughs> excuse my language, I'm a mess up, right? So why 
would you not take me, even though I tried these many times, take me and bring her back? And, um, you know, that I learned was bargaining in, um, in desperation and in um, depression. Long story short, my family, my mother and my brother, now a support system for me now, um, said, this is not going to work. And I went to Kings County and got help, right? Um, for me, there's a stigma with um, with reaching out, right? Because if you say you're depressed or if you say there's something wrong, whether it's mental illness, the feeling, or, um, you know, you're down, whatever it is, it's like you're supposed to bounce back, get over it. And that's not, that's not the way. Um, therapy brought me through a lot. And I knew I wanted therapy from a, a younger age, but, you know, to go about it was, was the hard part. Um, and I'm, I'm sad that I had to go through it in such a harsh way, but I'm happy that I, I got it right. There's a, a misconception where, of course, if you go see a therapist, if you go see a psychiatrist, you're crazy. Um, it's sad, right? There's other communities that cherish therapy, right? That thrive through therapy. But when we talk about therapy, we talk about talking to our best friends. So we talk about, you know, writing it down or keeping it to ourselves. No, um, the resources are out there, but there's far and few that look like us. And I think that that's the, the point about it is that we have to normalize it. We have to make sure that we are representation of what our community needs. Um, you know, there's a point of depression, which it's sad that I was in it for so long, but then also the seasonal depression as well, which um, can exacerbate the, the depression itself, right? Seasonal depression, um, it, especially in the North is a big factor because um, seasonal depression can be caused through uh, vitamin D deficiency, through light deficiency. Um, and that's the thing about it is people don't understand that if you're in depression or you have depression or signs of depression, it can be um, sped up. It can be um, more aggressive in the wintertime because we have the lack of sun. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of information that's out there. Suicide, as far as in the black community, um, in in general, it's a, it's a widespread and it has been um, more prevalent in the years to come. But in from, from what I've seen, some research they said that suicide in the black community is the second um, second largest killer. Right? It's also that it's younger people between ten and twenty four, um, which is wild. You know, like young people are trying it, and um, we don't speak about it. So the things that the the things that we're doing seem one off, but it's very typical with us. Um, and it could be the littlest things that spark it, right? And we hold these things and we hold this abuse and we hold these these words, these harsh words. It's even things that we see in our community that can spark it. And we're not, you know, it's not being addressed. Um, it's a big thing for me. I'm super um, happy in the place that I am. I've been in therapy for two and a half years now. Um, I've been in recovery for a year. Um, I've given up alcohol. Um, and besides my spirit, you know, my purpose is renewed. Um, when I checked into Kings County, um, I've, I've been there now about two and a half years. So the same amount of time as therapy. And, you know, I was hopeless. I gave up on a lot, including myself. Um, I'm older. And so I, I, you know, I didn't think I could have kids. And that was also a big part of it because that's what sparked it, right? Um, I was in a relationship for a very long time and did not have children. Um, and I kind of made peace with it um, in this program and the program that I was in, right? Because at this point I had to forgive myself. Um, the depression really took over because I was hurt, right? And once I realized that the hurt was from 
situations and, and circumstances, not myself, right? Uh, uncontrollable circumstances. I then um, grew, right? Um, I made amends to myself and I said, it's okay. You know, there are other options out there. There, there are children out there, there, there all type of things. And, and I felt better about myself. I stopped drinking uh, December, which is a year now, and um, got into a relationship um and february i was pregnant so um you know i had my bundle of joy in october and i'm so blessed um i just don't know you know a lot of times we're very hopeless i was very hopeless and i think um knowledge for me the understanding of the situation. Um, like Danita said, you know, understanding that there are different factors that contribute to um, our feelings, our depressions, our, our actions. You know, my, um, my thankfully failed attempts to suicide um, really, it's, it's needed. It's needed. And so I'm I'm blessed and I'm thankful. Um, right now I'm trying to um continue on because I know how um helpful first the program was and Rashawn, he's a part of it. Um and I wanna do the same thing. Um I am looking towards uh peer counseling and um the KSATs and and seeing what I can do. Um, as far as helping others um, that have been in my shoes or walking in my shoes or, you know, have the same experience because um, it it is wonderful to feel this way, but it's also um, going to be very rewarding, you know, to, to pay it forward, um, you know, to see people who flourished um, throughout their diversities and the, and the issues that we've had. Um, I want to contribute to it. So that's where I'm at right now. And thank you for listening. Oh man. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. And, um, definitely tell my friend I'm coming for him, man. If he, if he wants to join the conversation, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, thank for you so sure. much. Like, yeah, these are the, these are the things that, that, that motivate myself and some others. Um, and we have therapists here who are actually here. They're flanking you on both sides of the thing and then underneath you. So it, it, for sure, like, I'm glad that you're, that both of you are talking about that piece, the therapy piece and normalizing it. And that's what we need. One of those things we need to do in the community is normalize talking to someone. Cause think, cause we don't talk to our family members. Most of us, especially in the black community, that's something we don't talk about our feelings and emotions. A lot of us don't even know what our feelings truly are. You know, you know what I'm saying? And it's and it's tough to get through that. I understand that completely. I didn't understand it. There were some things that I didn't get until I started listening to other people like, oh, man. Yeah, I was going through that. But I didn't know that was that, you know, and sometimes you just need that feedback. You know, and sometimes you need that reassurance that what you're doing is OK in the way that you're feeling is OK. And it's OK not to be OK sometimes, you know. You're not supposed to be. I think you know something's wrong with you if you're happy all the time, every day. That's it's, it's impossible, you know. But if if you you think that's what you're supposed to be, and you're trying to live up to that, or if you're looking into other people to fulfill that, and to and to make you happy, that's another situation, you know. And like these are the things that we appreciate as as people, and people need to hear this stuff. Being open. And being honest about certain things should be the policy for everyone. And other times you have to sort of extend yourself a little bit to make other people brave enough to come out and say, like, you know what? Me too. You're right. I raise my hand. I'm with that. I was there, too. You know, and it's not. It, you know, and it doesn't take away from you. It doesn't make you a lesser person to say, you know what? I wasn't OK at this point in my life. I went through this. I felt like, you know, taking my own life at a point, you know, some of us have been through those things and it's okay to talk about. It. I was so lonely. 
I felt so stressed. I needed someone to talk to. Three numbers made a difference. 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Call, text, or chat 24-7. Someone was there to listen to me. And support me. Three numbers helped me find the help I needed. 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Call, text, or chat 24-7. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for sharing both of your stories, um, Sister Danita and Sister Nefertiti. I think it's very, it's not easy um, talking about something like this. Um, so I appreciate, we all appreciate your your courage and your bravery in talking about this. So, you know, I commend the both of you. Mm -hmm. And with that, I want to say that depression is something that's so vast. Um, there's postnatal depression, I mean, prenatal depression, there's postpartum depression, there's seasonal affective, seasonal depression, seasonal affective disorder, what we call. And seasonal affective um, disorder affects 10 million Americans every year, unfortunately. Um, and it's due to, you know, the lack of sunlight, change in time, uh, low melatonin, which is a hormone that affects our sleep, low serotonin, which affects our mood, and melatonin is found, it's a sleep hormone. It's found in the pineal gland of our, of our brains and it affects the sleep-wake cycle. So, you know, when, the, when there's a shift in, in from, you know, sunlight, to, from more sunlight to less sunlight, it uh, impacts our system. It, it impacts our biological clock tremendously. So it's normal that people will experience, you know, a form of depression. Also, serotonin is low. So when and carbohydrates, right? Food, you know, foods that are rich in carbohydrates like bread, rice, pasta, right? Serotonin produces um, when we take when we in, um, intake carbohydrates, we increase our serotonin levels. So during these times of the year, we also have a craving for carbohydrates, right? We have a deficient. We have a vitamin D deficiency, B twelve deficiency because of lack of sunlight. So we have, you know, we we have those deficiencies, right? So we need to take supplements. We need to take B12, vitamin D. Vitamin D is so crucial. And it's something that, you know, I took for granted a while back because I thought, oh, it's, it's just another vitamin, right? We have vitamin C, we have vitamin B. Why do we need vitamin D? We often overlook it, right? So it's important that we're taking supplements. We're taking, you know, we're eating foods that are rich in vitamin D, such as fish, um, certain meats, certain fruits and vegetables, and that, you know, we're getting, we're exposing ourselves to enough light. Um, exercise is something because, you know, during these, when these times of the year, people tend to gain weight or they have hypersomnia, meaning that they sleep too much or sleep too little. So we want to make sure that we're getting the right amount of sleep, exercise, and most importantly, that we're talking to a therapist. Um, you know, I come from the Bengali community. I come from the South Asian community where depression and mental health issues are stigmatized. There's a huge stigma around mental health and substance. And even in the, I think overall in the Muslim community, I think, you, you know, all of us here have, you know, some form of experience with it where, you know, it's deemed weak or you have a lack of faith or, you know, your faith, your what we call Iman, which is faith, right? It's low. Why aren't you praying enough, right? Why aren't you praying more? And not to say that prayer is important. Prayer is obviously, you know, one of the five pillars of, of our religion. But, you know, people tend to say, oh, but, you know, maybe your prayer isn't correct or you're not practicing enough, right? So those could be the, those are some reasons why, you know, people tend to believe that this person has depression or this person has a mental health issue. But in all honesty, depression can affect anyone. Depression doesn't care about race, religion, color of your skin, your age, your socioeconomic status, right? Depression can come from biological factors, genetics, environmental, right? Um, seasonal affective disorder is more prevalent in women and than in men and more prevalent in adults than in children. And Americans and in the US, people who are living in the North, they're more affected by it than those living in the South. So it doesn't matter, you know, what your background is, it's going to affect you one way or another. And I, I think that every human being, all of us have some form 
some level of depression. I think we undergo some level of depression. We're just too, our society just looks down upon it. And when they hear the word depression, they get scared or, you know, they get afraid or they just think that, oh, it, this person is weak or this person is, you know, not capable of, in, you know, functioning in society. So, you know, I, I say that to say that, you know, I think help is, I think help, seeking help is very important to speaking to someone you trust. One of the reasons why I got into this field is because there weren't therapists to look like me. Um, and I got into this field because I wanted to help my community, but I also wanted to help other communities of color who are undergoing the same experiences, but can't find anyone whom they trust or confide in. So, you know, I just hope that everyone understands their what their body needs, what their mind needs, and that they're able to, you know, seek the help, get the help that they need, and just not be afraid to talk about it. Um, there are all levels, there are all kinds of help. There is dialectical behavioral therapy. There is um, emotion-focused therapy. There's rational, emo emotive um, behave behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is common in used to treat depression because depression comes from the way that we think and our thought processes, right? So it's it's internal, right? When we think about depression, we think that when we hear depression or we think about it, it's mostly, you know, we internalize certain things. We blame ourselves. We have low self-esteem, right? It's We're not blaming others, we're blaming ourselves. So then it affects our, it becomes a negative cognitive distortion, right? Um, it affects our thought processes. We we tend to, you know, we, or we're always, you know, looking down upon ourselves. So we, if we shift that narrative, if we shift our chain, you know, or, you know, if we change our way of thinking, that can help. Like making a gratitude list. Think of the things that you're grateful for or the things that you've accomplished and reflect on that. So I hope that everyone, thank you for listening to me. I hope that everyone can benefit from this and inshallah, you know, get the help that you need because it's important. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. It's a lot of good information uh, that you gave Sister Nazia. She always comes with it like that too. MashaAllah, every time. <laughs> so, but yeah, definitely we have to use those resources. A great resource is 988, right? Everybody knows about 988. It should be one of those things that's, that's um, programmed in phones like 911. You should have that. Or an app. Um, there's better health. There's a lot of different things that we can get into uh, as far as that. But first, before I mean, or before we uh, get into those resources and stuff like that, if y'all have any resources, put it in the chat so that people can go back and look at them later. But for sure, you know, um, let me ask my sister Yusma. If you ready, go ahead, sis. Alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Wa alaikum salam. I hope everyone's doing well tonight. Uh, first and foremost, um, oh my gosh, thank you, Sister Nefertiti, Sister Denitha. Um, you know, you you guys both came in because some of us are strangers to you. You came in and you just dove right in and you shared probably some of the most vulnerable, open parts of you, which is, you know, as others mentioned, not easy. It's it's really it's brave isn't even the word it doesn't cover it so I genuinely truly appreciate and acknowledge that you both just came in and you shared that with us because again some of us are strangers and those things are not easy to do um so I appreciate that thank you guys so much uh and I know that there it there are people who are <laughs> who are going to be listening to this you know whether live or recorded who will find something in there in your experiences in your lives that I know that they're going to be able to reflect with um, and I I can't speak for everyone but for myself um, I got into the field of substance use and mental health counseling um, because I was close with someone who did uh, complete suicide and um she was a very very close friend of mine she was like a sister to me and i was about 19 at the time that it happened and it was something that really truly um i i couldn't 
I couldn't forget it. I couldn't, you know, leave it behind. You know, as both of you mentioned, a lot of people say those things that, you know, uh, just kind of it's in the past or, you know, you leave those things behind or get over it, so to say. Um, and that is absolutely not something that can be done that it just it, it's not in human nature, I believe, to move past that because that's not inherently, you know, how we are. Um, and uh, and that was actually what prompted me to get into therapy to begin with, um, because initially I kept thinking, OK, uh, maybe I can move past it. Maybe I can try to, you know, do something about it by myself without asking for help, without trying to look for help. And so that really was to my own personal detriment. It affected every aspect of my life. Um, and it was something that, uh, you know, like within my family, within the community, a lot of people couldn't understand what that was about. Just, you know, the concept of uh, trying to either hurt oneself or what it does to a person, what it does to people around them. Um, and, you know, again, that's not to minimize the actual thing event itself, but just that there's so many different aspects of it. And you think at some point, you know, maybe it doesn't affect you like that. And then it sneaks up on you and it just it hits you like a, a brick wall and it catches you off guard. Um, and, and I believe, you know, for after several years of having all of that built up, I believe that's what happened. Um, and it really affected me in, again, like I said, every aspect of my life. Um, you know, I've, I've been in therapy for 10 plus years now. And, um, and, you know, therapists need therapy. I, anyone that says differently is not being honest with themselves. Therapists need therapy. Uh, we need to be in some kind of safe space in treatment, we need that recovery because that is a recovery. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people who are not, who are therapists, but not always comfortable with the idea of being in therapy. Uh, and, you know, whether it's someone who looks like you, doesn't look like you, but you need a, a space and a place to be able to, to go. Um, and, and thankfully, thankfully, I've had uh, the same therapist for about as long as I've been in therapy. Um, you know, I want people to know that if there is a therapist that you don't necessarily sit well with, or if you don't feel comfortable with, look around, find, find a therapist that does fit your needs, that does fit uh, what you're looking for, because they're, they're there for you, right? Not the other way around. So, you know, Again, um, I had initially, I think I went through like two or three therapists. I wasn't very comfortable with them until I finally found someone that I was comfortable with. Um, and it was someone who kind of, you know, they, they understood both the, the religious and the spiritual aspect. They understood, you know, uh, the, the family aspect. They understood cultural aspect. They understood all the different aspects that make up a person. So, you know, we go through all of these different experiences. We live through them. And we should be able to go into a space where someone can at the very least empathize with what we're saying and what we're talking about. Um, and specifically, you know, uh, Sister Nazi had brought up so many different kinds of, of depression, anxiety. Um, a lot of these things are connected. You know, our life events are not, they don't happen in a vacuum. They don't happen by themselves. Um, and uh, so many of us are expected to just kind of pick up the pieces and keep moving. And, you know, that's, again, human nature doesn't allow us to do that. We're in this uh, environment of constantly moving. You know, we live in New York City. It's such a fast paced uh, city. It's it. Everything is just happening all at once. And we're expected to just experience things. Um, traumatic things a lot of times. And we're just kind of expected to be like, okay, well, you know, this happened and you, you, you had about a day or so, and now it's time to just keep it moving. Um, and that's, that's not how it should be. And that's not what human nature is supposed to be like. Um, you know, we, we use our communities, we try to go to our communities, to the people that matter to us. Um, you know, again, um, Sister Denitha mentioned this, Sister Nefertiti mentioned this, like family is so important family, people that we connect with, people that we feel safe around. Um, and, you know, we want to be able to at least to an extent use that because that's so important for us. Uh, and it really does help us to start 
to kind of, you know, accept certain things and talk about certain things. Um, you know, I like this is this is a little family that we have here, to be honest. Um, and we we've, we've created this beautiful little family, this space, and uh, you know, we can come here and talk about these things. And this is, you know, this is how we use the people that we know, okay, I know I can be here and share things and talk about things. Um, and I know that everyone here is like very compassionate, loving, empathic, and kind. And everyone always has something so beautiful and welcoming and informative to tell us. Um, and, you know, I can't, there's not much I can add to what Sister Nazi had said about depression. I, there's so many things about it, you know, taking care of yourself, um, eating well. Uh, and I know, you know, um, I was uh, speaking to another sister the other day and she mentioned, you know, when, when she was in the midst of uh, very severe postpartum depression, um, you know, she wasn't eating at, at all. And it was just, she didn't realize she wasn't eating. She didn't realize that she was going through this difficult time where, uh, you know, maybe she couldn't take care of herself. Um, you know, she maybe she wasn't changing her clothes. She wasn't eating. She wasn't really uh, feeding or nurturing her body. And, you know, that's that's part of it is taking care of yourself. Um, and those are the little bits and pieces that we can kind of, you know, gather to help us a little bit. Um, because until we are able to kind of seek help it's it can be really difficult to get out of that that anxiety um traumatic experiences uh things that we've gone through um so you know again i just i really really appreciate um sister nefertiti uh, Ms. Denitha, thank you so much for for just being here for bringing your presence here and and just sharing that with us in this space it's uh it's very beautiful to me thank you mm -hmm. so much Thank you so much, Sister Nazia. Thank you for your work and what you do. And it's it's a beautiful thing when you look at just look at this room, this little chat room we have here, and all and and we've all from different parts of the planet. Mm -hmm. Bronze is from like seven different parts of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might not even be from this planet, but we're here. We're all here together. You know, and I was. <laughs> And I would say on on a whole, man, it's it's a lot of love in these in these rooms and in, in these places that 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 we frequent. And those are the places that um we belong. Everything else or some other things hurt. And a brother had made a statement a while ago. He was like, yo, love should never hurt. You know? So all of the different things that we go through, depression and all these other things that we go through, and, and it reminds me of a um a story when Sister Houston was talking, I did a, a Zoom meeting for another company that I was working that I was working for before I left to work at Kings County. And I did a, a, a Zoom and I didn't think I thought that it was going to be like corny. This is going to be the most boring Zoom ever. Right. So but I did it on postpartum depression. It was a sister from um, Guyana. She was from Guyana. And she was talking about um she was talking about postpartum and what she was going through. Long story short, at the end of it, I thought it was like crickets. Nobody was moving. You know how sometimes you see people like this on the Zoom? You know, you know everybody's talking, looking the other way. I'm like, these people are not even paying attention. So when, when it came to the discussion part, just started to ask a question. The first young, first young lady, actually she was older than me, but she started to remember how when she first had her baby, she said she didn't realize she was experiencing postpartum until she realized she didn't have any feelings for her baby. So they went to give her the child and she flinched. I was like, well, like she had no connection. Like she didn't just have the baby. So like, you know, you know, they usually lay them on your chest for a while. So that nothing. She said she felt absolutely nothing. What saved her was, or what saved her child was, because she had PTSD because she was in war in Korea. You know, um, so what saved her child was because she said she had a fear that she was going to take her child out, you know. Um, and she said what saved her was her grandmother. Her grandmother noticed what it was and took the baby from her. There's so many people who still have that stigma of going to a physical office or a location to see a therapist. Better help takes the stigma out of getting counseling skills or seeking help for people. Brother Gav, are you there?
Okay. Yep. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Good evening, everyone. Um, everyone's narrative, as usual, is very powerful. And there's no words that I can say that can compensate for the power that was displayed in the narrative. But what I will do is that I will just try to give my two cents in terms of what I was able to absorb, what, what I was able to receive. So based on what I was able to receive, it reminds me of my favorite verse from the Quran, chapter three, verse 190, where Allah says, Verily for the intelligent, there are signs within the creation of the heavens and earth, as well as the separation of night and day. So every single person's story is under the umbrella of those ayat, under those signs. When people spoke about their, their experiences with sadness and depression and their trauma, those are ayat, those are signs their experiences as per their suicide attempts. Those are signs. And they're signs for us who either have shared experiences or no experiences in terms of suicide. It's a sign for us to have um, what is known as a rifq in the Arabic language, empathy, to have compassion to care about people because Islamically we're Islamically mandated to care about other people. That's a farida. That's an Islamic mandate to care about other people. It's literally a sin to be apathetic. It's literally a sin to be an apath. So the term for apathy and arrogance in the Arabic language is al-istigbar and also kibr. So kibr is Kibbutz is understood two ways. It could be positive pride or negative pride. So one of the definitions that Muhammad, peace be upon him, discussed in terms of kibr, negative pride, he mentioned apathy, arrogance is rejecting truth and mocking people. And I'm going to focus on the latter part of the two-part definition that Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned about apathy, arrogance. We do this a lot as human beings. We mock other people. We mock other people through dismissing their trauma. Just like how a lot of people mention, oh, just get over it. Just um, buckle up, buttercup, or just man up, those type of things. Those are deflections. That's deflective language. That's dismissive language. That's apathetic. That's an apathetic posture. To tell someone, oh, you're strong, just get over it. That's not the correct way to uh, engage and approach another person when they're telling you that they've been through something. And then what ends up happening is that we have, as human beings, some of us have selective empathy. For example, if someone were to say, oh, I got raped, right? The average person is not going to say, oh, get over it. Because that's understood that that's apathetic as hell. That's, that's just universally understood, right? But when someone says they're going through something less severe, they'll say, oh, you strong, just get over it. Or if someone comes and says, yo, I have a substance abuse problem. Or I have a pornography problem. They'll be like, oh, just stop doing it. Just get over it. We should never approach people and engage people that way. Every si Regardless of whether or not we deem it to be very severe or minimally severe, Islamically, we have an obligation to approach people with the same empathetic energy, regardless of how lowly we view an issue or regardless of how highly we view an issue. And again, the problem that we have as human beings is that we have we have selective empathy. We care about what we feel like caring about, as opposed to caring about the individual and their individual circumstance, and their individual fits in, their individual traumas. We have an obligation to care about each individual person based on their individual circumstances. And we suck at doing that. We're really bad at doing that. And that's one of the reasons how and why people are so afraid to open up to other people. Because they're literally afraid, and rightfully so, 
They're afraid of being dismissed and deflected and mocked relative to the trauma that they express. Because realistically, if I if I have the indic if if I have the instinct or if I have the idea that somebody is going to deflect and mock my trauma, shit, I ain't gonna tell nobody. Why should I? What, what's what's the point when there's so many examples, too many examples of people deflecting and dismissing the trauma and the pain of another person? I don't want to be on another person's apathetic hit list. So since I don't want to be on another another person's apathetic hit list, then why should I tell anyone? But we have to be people of empathy. We have to be people of compassion. We have to care about people. We have to be those people whose ears and eyes and minds and hearts are open, ready and willing to receive the narratives of other people. And by us providing these spaces that makes life easier for other people. And in fact, Muhammad, peace on him, he mentioned, he said, there's four types of people whom Allah has made hell forbidden to consume. He mentioned those who are gentle with people, those who are patient with people, those who lend their time to other people, those who make themselves available for other people. Those who make the lives of other people easier. Like literally this work that we do, Muslim peer services, it literally covers all four of those characteristics. And may Allah make us of those whom the hellfire has been commanded by Allah to not consume. Because that's important. Because because if that's not the end, if that's not the end game, if that's not the goal to do this work so that in the hereafter Allah commands the hellfire to not consume our souls, then what's the point of us doing these lives and these videos? What's, what's the point? We just key keying and chit chatting and yippity yapping. We, we, we need to, we need to really be those like, again, whose ears, eyes, minds, and hearts are open and ready to receive the people. So I, I'm grateful that those who've chosen to share their narratives have shared their narratives because those things take courage. It takes courage to admit publicly that you've experienced trauma, any type of trauma, whether it led you towards the path of suicide ideation or not, whether it led you towards porn addiction or this addiction or that addiction or gang violence or self-harm regardless of whether it led you to those addictions or not, the fact that you had the courage to disclose those deep, dark, intimate parts of yourselves to the public, because this is literally seen publicly. The fact that you are willing to do this publicly, it's a manifestation of courage. And I always tell people, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness and ability to confront fear. And anytime that someone tells their narrative, they're literally facing their fear. They're facing their fear of criticism. They're facing their fear of being the victims and casualties of deflection and dismissal and apathy. That, that takes courage. So I'm grateful that those who share their narratives, I'm, I'm grateful to Allah that they share them. Because again, that takes an immense amount of courage. And for us on, for us on the listening end, on the receiving end, we have to be humble. We have to be humble enough to allow our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts to receive the narratives that are being disclosed. And then we have to honor those narratives by not deflecting the traumas of other people. And also we have to honor those narratives by really making ourselves available for those who go through traumatic experiences. And that is part of the work that we do. That that's the that's the hustle. That's the foundation. That's the principle in which we work with to do the work that we do. So, yes, um, I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, I wanted to chime in on the postpartum as well. You know, I think um, now that I am a mother, <laughs> um, it was a big part for me to manage that as well like I know that I was depressed right I didn't have to be diagnosed um like uh Yasma and Nasiat said you know it was more of the knowing 
right? And with me being in therapy now, I had to make a plan, you know, to, to make sure, um, as you said, Rashawn, you know, sometimes there are these issues when, when you have a child and um, I didn't want that to happen, you know? So I made a plan and I, I thought forward. Um, fortunately, I'm in love with my little girl, um, but people need to be proactive. You know, I think once we get a hold of the situation doesn't mean that it's always going to be. Um, and so being proactive and having those backup plans and um, the, the the resources uh, for sure. And then also, uh, Brother Gareth, like, you know, that's where I've moved, you know, in this program. Um, the biggest thing for me is that a lot of people come through those doors um, with um, whether it's mental illness or substance abuse. And um, unfortunately, not everybody's in a situation that I am, that I have grasped the concept and, and um, is as capable as I am to work through these things. And so it is about um, when we do recognize that we're in a better position that we pay it forward. So, um, you know, I appreciate everyone that's on here and I will continue to do this work in any capacity that I can. So thank you. Oh, no, thank you. And truth be told, coming into, I kind of learned from Nefertiti, she was there before me, before I started working there. And I kind of learned from her, like she used to walk in, maybe not when she first was there, but when I got there, she started the habit of greeting people as they walked in. She would walk all the way around the room and give hugs and talk to everybody. And if somebody was new, she would introduce herself, such and such. And if somebody didn't show up, you know, a couple of days, she was on the phone or, you know, got a message to these people to make sure that everybody was. See, these are the things that I learned, like, yo, you know, this is what we supposed to be doing as individuals outside in the street, whether in the program or not. We don't see people in the message in the street for weeks. You know, we run into him six months later, like, yo, you know, I was just thinking about you. You ain't call me. You have my number. You you know, you ain't send me a kite, send up a smoke signal, send a pigeon, nothing like. But this is what happens, you know, with us as individuals. We get wrapped up in our own lives so much we forget the service part of it, you know, and we stay well, you know, unconnected. I was like that for a long time. I didn't really care to connect with people. I'm still kind of a loner. I don't have a group, a whole bunch of friends. Like, if you see me, I'm by myself. If you see me at an event, I'm usually by myself. Whether it's my event or somebody else's event. But if you come and talk to me, you know, I'm I'm cool. I'm just not the, you know, the initiator of things. And, but these um different topics, when we talk about all this depression, and especially the suicide part, I didn't even know, the first time I ever even knew anything about suicide, that, that it was a reality. Of course, I knew it existed, right? But the reality was, I remember this, it was this young fella. He was a little bit older than me. So I had to be maybe 12 or 13. So I think Darrell had to be maybe 15, 16 years old. He was an incredible basketball player. So we used to go and watch him on the court. We had this place in Coney Island called The Garden. It's a little piece of pavement with two rims, but it was like an iconic place. My sister knows what I'm talking about. You know, you would see people sitting on the, you know, it was like the Rucker in Coney Island. So people sitting on the fence to be packed to all of the games there. So we were there to watch, you know, watch people play and watch the games. And one day I saw this same guy standing on the roof of my grandmother's building talking about he wanted to jump because his girlfriend left him. He's only, he was about 15 years old, 15, 16 tops. And I was like, yo, you know, they were able to talk him down. Years later, he goes to college and went to California. Years later, we heard that they found him somewhere with his, with his, you know, whatever he did, chopped up. And body parts spread all over a certain city in California. He was trying to, he couldn't do it himself, so he forced somebody else to do it. And how he did that was, you know, whatever that way was. We heard stories. but. However that happened, he's going there. That was the first time I ever realized that that was an option. I didn't even know that was a real thing. I thought that was something that you see on TV and be honest that white folks do. You know what I mean? Like, 
is is downtrodden as beaten down as we were as a people, you would expect us to be the first ones to want to check out. So and and it really not like that. And maybe it was, but it was so secret because we don't come out and talk about it. Maybe it was. You'll never hear from our parents. I got you. You will never hear from our parents. We'll never hear from cousins. We'll never hear from nephews. But it's a reality. Uh, go ahead, sis. Um, when it comes to suicide and the act of taking life, I wanted to expand on that because it's sometimes it's not the fact of you taking your life. Um, you can also go through suicide in many ways. Like there is suicide by cop where you do things that are destructive to the community where the cops come. And then what I went through because the, there were times I did it by my own hand and it didn't work. I became, for years, I became very self-destructive to where it's not that deep down, I know I cared, but in the surface, I'm like, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm done. I'm over this. So I engaged in immoral, senseless, reckless activity where I fought all the time or I was always in somebody's faces. Like now, generally, I'm not a confrontational person. I'm not, a, ah, but I am a problem solver and you're going to feel me, point blank, period. But it got to a point where I'm like, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm just getting, and it became a thing where, yeah, I became very self-destructive and I wanted to take people down with me because I didn't have the tools necessary to say, I need help. I need to stop inflicting this pain. And when you're not in the right frame of mind. Now, I can share some of my diagnosis. I suffer from PTSD. I suffer from schizoaffective disorder, which is a combination of bipolar and schizophrenia. I also suffer from very high anxiety. I suffer from anxiety and I also suffer from depression all year round. doesn't matter. But seasonal makes it even worse, especially with the trauma that I experienced. So knowing that I'm already in a, a dual mind where I know I know right from wrong, but now I'm in this particular headspace where it's like, yeah, I know right from wrong, but I don't care. And it's conscious and what people fail to understand is that it's not we choose to wake up in the morning and be like, we want to do this. It's just it's so many things that impact and it keeps going and it keeps going. And then there's no end in sight to where it's like, okay, I tried doing it myself. So now I got all these cuts. I have this rope. I have this rope burn. Um, now I have my organs that's messed up because I didn't drink myself to death and that didn't work. Um, so now I'm going to have somebody else do it. So so I, I'm sorry, I caught, I caught a flashback because I've been there too many times to count. And with knowing this and knowing what I did now, was it reckless? Yeah. Was it crazy? Yeah. But a lot of people don't understand that there, there was, there's, if they do it, they'll do it. There was other ways to do it. They will find other ways to do it because... <sighs> What I it's a Christian, it's a Christian proverb, but I'm gonna try to simplify it. It's harder to do, it's it's easier to do wrong than it's harder than and it's harder to do right, especially if you've been conformed to it for so long. And that's from the mind of I'm over this, it's done. There's too many things happening to me. This is happening, that's happening, nobody's doing anything about it. I tried this, this didn't work. I tried that, that didn't work. So I'm going to go out here and I'm going to wreak havoc. But then now, once you obtain the services, because when I when I was going into treatment, the only thing they wanted to do was pump you up full of meds and send you on your way because you was just a bet. And if you go to a therapist, you go. If you don't, you don't. And a lot of people, and a lot of people, and it's a stigma in this community too, where yeah, I'll do my time. Some people treat it like it's jail. Where it's like, okay, well, I'll go here and I'll stay here a couple of weeks and they'll let me out. And okay, what now? Because they don't have a, they don't have the right resources because it's not a I'm not saying it's not available to our community. Sometimes it's not accessible and we don't have the right people to guide us towards that. 
especially if you're in a small and if you have family members who that frowns upon this and you have friends that frown upon this then it's like okay you're going back to the place that made you sick in the first place so it's like in my case that's what happened and i had to make a stand where now i have to live for me this didn't work this is the third time it didn't work what am i here to do and thank goodness for the caseworker that i had at the time because she was a sister and she was like, look, you know, you don't belong here. <laughs> and at this time I was going, I was going for my degree in human services and I had missed my finals. And she was like, now, you know, you have no business doing this. You should know better, but I understand you're going through a rough time. So I'm going to recommend you to X, Y, Z. I can't force you to do it, but I think it's in your best interest if this is the path where you want to go. It, and it's okay to not be okay. And I remember sitting down in that woman's office. Her name was Malika Ali. And to this day, I remember her name and I cried in her office. I, I mean, I'm talking snot, tears. My ears was clogged, the whole shebang, because I was like, okay, I can do this. There's hope. And I had to cancel the outside noise to where I knew the environment that I was getting into. I, I had to I had to hold myself accountable. Like I can only hold myself accountable to what I'm able to do. I cannot hold my I cannot hold anybody else accountable for my wellness. I have to hold myself accountable for my own. And there are some people who are on board and then there are some who are not. And you know what? That's okay. Because they're not equipped to do it, or they was raised at a time where, oh, it's not a problem. Okay. And at this point, it's about your wellness and your path and your journey. And what are you going, going to do to get better? And if you have the outside resources to do that and they'll welcome you with open arms and they'll guide you, then please take advantage of it because they'll they'll give you other, like they'll give you other means of uh, like a peer group, like like your like Muslim peer services or other groups where it's relatable and you'll meet people that are just like you that are healing just like you and y'all heal y'all can heal each other in some aspects because healing is linear and you might have a drug problem i have an alcohol problem this one over here is going through this and this one is going to do that but we pull our resources and it will still thrive and will still flourish so it's a lot it's a process it's not an overnight thing mm -hmm. Because you're gonna do more harm than good. You're gonna do more harm than good trying to fast track your way into wellness. It's a lifetime thing. You're all when when you are, when you come with suicidal tendencies and suicidal ideologies, you have to understand that it's an ongoing lifetime recovery process because the traumas are still gonna be there. You have to find a way to identify your triggers, reroute those triggers and put them into a positive, into a I got my degree in human services. And that's why I decided I wanted to be a life coach because I've seen this too many times and I've always made my best interest, made it in my best interest to not treat people like they've treated me. And I try not to lash out and I've treated people more better than I treated myself. So, and, and okay, Catholic guilt, like you treat people where I spread myself too thin and I was, then I became self-destructive to my own self where I'm like, okay, I did all this, I did all this, now what can I do? Why am I here? What am I doing this for? And I had to take this deep breath, identify like, okay, this is trauma. Let's reroute this. It's not a complete setback. Mm -hmm. You have faith. God got you here for a reason. Mm -hmm. Let's reroute this. Let's try this again. What can we do differently? You don't have to go into a full meltdown. You're not in that place anymore. And that's what I that's what I do with people. Where they're like, people call me and I be on TikTok and I hold live sessions and they're like, well, I'm gonna have a meltdown. I'm like, okay, before you have a meltdown, how was your day? What did this happen? Are you seeing a therapist? Okay, if you're not seeing a therapist, what state do you live in? And I and as I'm talking to them, talking them off the water tower, I'm Googling what kind of insurance do you have? You can text it to me, whatever. And I'm pulling up different resources for them. Mm -hmm. Now, once you see a therapist, 
come back to me and I'll work out how you can re-identify your triggers, how can you do this and how you can thrive and how you can flourish because I've been there. And that's what this community needs. That's what a lot of people need because they say it's so frowned upon and it's always, oh, they just want attention or you'll find somebody who does the work that we do and the work that y'all do importantly and they do it for all the wrong reasons. So that's something else that we have to look out for because I've been there too, where I had a therapist that I'm telling all my business to and they're telling the person who is traumatizing me everything so where there's a distrust. So, and there's a lot of people who don't trust therapists. So they come to me and I'll be like, you know what? Go to a therapist who you can trust, seek a higher counsel that you can trust. And even, and I spoke, speak to a lot of religious people, whether they're Jewish, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Christian. If you don't feel comfortable speaking to a therapist, make sure you speak to your, I mean, make sure you speak to your priest, make sure you speak to your pastor, speak to somebody so they can guide you to the resources that fit you. Mm. And we need a lot of that. Yeah. And, and I can say that for a fact because it worked. It worked right. for me. And yes, right me. now I'm, I'm talking to y'all and I'm taking an anatomy class because I'm getting my certification in herbalism. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> I, I see where your niece gets it from. We used to call her like a professional student. That woman got, I'm, I'm not even going to ask you how many degrees oh, you have. Professional. I already know. I love to learn. Yeah. Um, I have 10 certifications and four degrees. <laughs> right. I figured that. <laughs> Working on number 11. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, no doubt. And 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 sincerely, sis, I'm proud of you, man, from where you came and all of and all of you, you know, from from where we came. And like you say, even a the therapist and the people who are in certain positions, you don't really get to know their whole backstory, you know, but they've come from somewhere, too. Just like our parents have come from somewhere, too. The people that are around us has come from somewhere. Nobody just popped up out of the ground and was an adult and responsible you know a lot of people went through what we would call quote unquote hell on this planet um and some of us have had easy lives and still we just don't you know have the ability to to cope with certain things and it, and this is what we're here to do we're here to grow we're here to learn we're here to help each other and like the brother said you know if we're not trying to make this thing better if i'm not trying to help you if i'm not trying to help the next person if we're not trying to make this planet better, then what exactly are we doing? We just here talking, you know? And in reality, uh, tomorrow I'm supposed to be at a graduation for um for the peer supporters, for the for the new uh class of, of peer peer specialists. And they want me to give a talk. And I think and my talk was going to be on have the right intentions. And that's what it always should be. You know, you have the right intentions when you when you want to do this this sort of work. You can't go in there with the wrong intentions. If you're going just to make money, you know, you can do that, but go somewhere else with that. You plan with people's lives. You know, these people are serious about their recovery and what they're doing. You know, and and it's and it's, you know, I took like I said, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from Nefertiti, I learned a lot from Mikey, I learned a lot from Franz. Some of these people that are in this room right now. I learned a lot from my sister just hearing certain things. And then my my own life experience, being able to put it together and now see it a little bit more clearly because somebody else showed me through their lens. I was looking through my own foggy glasses. Somebody else gave me some 2020 joints. And I'm like, OK, it's a little bit clear now because I've I seen how you how you walk through that. So I want to thank everybody. If, there, if there's any remarks, anybody would like to say anything closing before we leave? Or is everybody good? Because I know we went way over and I saw the little mama's up now. So that means it's time to go. Franz, you wanted to say something, Franz? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say good evening, everyone. My name is Franz, ex drug addict, ex alcoholic, and all the above. Um, I just want to say I'm humbled to be here this evening amongst my family. I could say, you know, because um, I felt a lot of a, a lot of power in this room tonight, and um, I appreciate it. And even though I didn't get a chance to share my story, but my story was shared by each and every one of y'all. And I appreciate everybody here. Thank you very much for this. Mm, thanks. Hey, Franz, we got to have you come on, man, where we, you know, 
give you your time because your story is powerful as well. We're not discounting that. We just have time limits. <laughs> so, and actually yeah, we went over by like 30 minutes. So trust me, it's not personal, but I want we, we definitely need to hear that as well. So maybe we need a part two to this if everybody will agree. Okay, alhamdulillah. All right, thank you. As mm -hmm. always, I want to thank the team. I want to thank Sister Naziat. I want to thank Yusma. I want to thank Gareth. And also our special guests, uh, Nefertiti and Donitha. I want to thank Beto Gemma, House of Community, who's always our partners. And also, um, and Sister Sister Naziat, before we leave, because I've been watching you online, right? And we don't get invites to these award shows and stuff that you get us. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to just give a little, just a couple, a uh, couple seconds on your organization and what you do exactly. Huh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, that means a lot. Um, so I have my organization is called Pearls of Wellbeing. Um, I started this organization in 2019. Um, it's a social media through social media platform, Instagram, and it's basically to raise awareness around mental health, demystify stigmas, and just raise awareness about mental health and mental health issues, how to treat it, how to treat them, um, how to nurture your mind, your soul through healthy tips and strategies, um, especially in the South Asian community, the Muslim community, and for all communities, really. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. All right, thank you so much. And you will see her information and stuff up after we edit it. We usually put it at the beginning and at the end, you will see her and all of her information. And, info. and I will invite you to future award shows, inshallah. Thank you, thank you very much, because I'm looking at the awards. Like, why are we not there? I'm just, you know, I, I want to stand up and clap. It's okay. <laughs> inshallah. But yeah, because I'm so proud of everyone in this room. Believe me when I tell you. Exactly. You know, and my wife would tell you, I don't, I don't get excited about much. I'm joking, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, um, everyone. And um, wow, this has been a powerful thing, man. And we, you know, and I hope to see all of y'all again, you know, when we do our next uh, programs and stuff like that. And I I guess I'll see maybe Franz and them, uh, not tomorrow, but Friday, maybe. Not even. All right. <laughs> so, and I know, uh, oh, oh, you macaroni and cheese. But stuff for you, but to be late. I mean, salam alaikum, bro. Salam. Bye, salam alaikum. At some point in our lives, we've all gone through some form of depression, isolation, anxiety, and hopelessness. MPS is here to help you navigate through those tough times and show you that there is hope. You are not alone. Our peer support specialists use their own lived experiences to help assist others on their own road to recovery. Our mission here at MPS is to create a culture of healing and wellness for all of humanity. Using the guiding principles of Islam and the eight dimensions of wellness to foster long-term recovery for those who face mental health and substance use challenges. At MPS, we understand recovery is not one size fits all, but rather person-centered. We understand the importance of the work that MPS can provide. If you or someone you know is in need of our services, please contact us at 347-830-7766 or muslimpeerservices.com.